Welcome back to another episode of Thinking Critically. Today, I'm joined by Dr. John Allen Paulos, who is a best-selling author, mathematician, public speaker, and formerly a monthly columnist for abcnews.com, and occasionally for The Guardian and Scientific American. He grew up in Chicago and Milwaukee, received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Wisconsin. Now is a professor of mathematics at Temple University in Philadelphia. In addition to being the author of a number of scholarly papers on mathematical logic, probability, and the philosophy of science, Dr. Paulos has written Mathematics and Humor, I Think, Therefore I Laugh, and Numeracy, Mathematical Illiteracy and Its Consequences, Beyond Numeracy, Ruminations of a Numbers Man, and many more. His most recent book, and the primary focus of today's episode, is Who's Counting? Uniting Numbers and Narratives with Stories from Pop Culture, Puzzles, Politics, and More. Anyway, John, thank you so much and welcome. Uh, thanks. It's a pleasure being here. I'm not, I'm not quite sure where here is, but uh, <laughs> uh, here in the uh, internet space, right. I suppose. Right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> here on Zoom. Uh, anyway, John, I always like to start off an episode by asking individuals kind of how they got started on their path. So, in your instance, you're a mathematician. So, where did your curiosity in mathematics uh, come from? Like. Was it always with you from an early age, and uh, or is it something that you developed later on? I'm well, just curious was, to hear your story. I was always good at math. I mean, there, there's one episode that I relate in uh, a book, A Numerate Life, uh, which had uh, some impact, uh, maybe a lot, I don't know. I, I was in fourth or fifth grade, and uh, the Milwaukee uh, Journal would uh, publish uh, statistics regarding the Milwaukee Braves. And there was this pitcher who uh, was brought up in the minor leagues. He allowed five runs, uh, got only one out. And uh, during a discussion in class, you know, we talked about sports or whatever. I say a pitcher who allows five runs and gets only one man out it has an earned run average of 135. And the teacher who was kind of a martinet and a bully, kind of a big red face, bulbous nose, say he can't. <laughs> You can't have an earn run average more than 27. Sit down, sit down. And uh, I remember my face got all red. I was kind of embarrassed. But um, anyway, at the end of the season, this season, this pitcher had never been brought up, uh, had never uh, pitched again, he was sent back down to the minors. And they, the journal uh, published the statistics for the season, and it said his name, earn run average of 135. So I brought the newspaper in, and I showed the teacher and he said, oh, sit down, sit down. Don't. Anyway, uh, he, he, he was you know, upset and uh, I knew I was right. And I knew he was wrong and I knew he knew I was right. And that this kind of had an effect on me with a little bit of logic and a little bit of calculation. Uh, you could vanquish blowhards, <laughs> even if you were small and your face got red all the time. And uh, this had an impact on me. And uh, to some extent, some of my writings kind of are in that same vein. I want to debunk uh, uh, ideas that people, bullhards, believe that uh, aren't, uh, don't make sense. Yeah, that's very interesting that you were influenced from such a young age. This one teacher in particular set, sent you down this path where, well, you were always good at mathematics, but then, like you said, um, you're interested in debunking nonsense when people yeah, just yeah. Is people talk about good pedagogy and he was a bad teacher but he had more of an impact on, <laughs> on the good, and good I'm, I'm, of whom i have had a lot as well but nevertheless yeah and i you know i guess i can relate a little bit to that where it sounded like the teacher was basically telling you that you're wrong and that you couldn't do it and i've had some instances of that in my life with professors or teachers, right. professors from university or teachers uh, when I was younger, telling me that I can't do something. And I'm one of those personality types will, where I'm like, well, if you think I can't do it, I know I can do it. I'm going to show you that I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a useful trait to have. Yeah, absolutely. Even if it sometimes is the case that you can't do something. <laughs> well, I mean, you have to give it your all, right? If you can't do it, you the only way that you're going to know that is if you try and try again and you keep failing so okay. who yeah. knows yeah 
Failing okay. It's a good thing to do. No, absolutely. Okay, so you were always interested in mathematics. And then at some point you decided that you wanted to study mathematics in university. At what point you were like, you know what? I think that I want to do this professionally. Well, it took a while because I, as an undergraduate, I, I moved around, uh, started out in engineering and physics. I was always taking math, uh, switched my major to philosophy, uh, uh, switched to English. I wanted to be a writer, back to math, back to English. And finally, I settled on math, got my bachelor's degree, and then uh, decided uh, I wanted to do math. I, and, but I always had a kind of philosophical approach uh, uh, to, to mathematics uh, rather than um, you know, uh, a focus on hemi semi demi loops of order seven or something, which uh, ne never captured my fancy. But uh, looking at mathematics as a whole, mathematical logic, the structure of math, the philosophical uh, resonance uh, is what appealed to me. That's really interesting. So you said you bounced around a lot. So when you went into university, what did you uh, what did you go in as, or were you undecided? I was undecided. I, undecided. I, okay. I was very good at math, but I wasn't decided. Uh, I hadn't yet decided to go into math mathematics full time, even though I took obviously took math all the way through. I'm mm -hmm. in math. And you took a little physics in there. Did I hear that right? Uh, some physics. Some philosophy, some of uh, just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> just about everything, kind of, kind of like testing the waters out a little bit until you figured out that you wanted to do mathematics. Uh, yeah. I, 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 uh, English, I returned to a couple of times. I wanted to be a writer, so in, in a sense, I, I did follow up on on that and brought into this because my 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 books all kind of straddle, not all, but most of them straddle a kind of sometimes chasm that separates uh, narratives from numbers, uh, uh, stories from statistics, and, and so on. So uh, that's why my, most of my books uh, have a broad range of interests. I mean, mathematics is kind of an imperialist discipline. It invades other disciplines and sometimes even takes them over. So um, that is part of its appeal for me as well. Well, you said that you were conflicted about maybe, you know, maybe you wanted to go the English route, but it looks at, at the end of the day, you were able to do both, right? Because wow. you write, you write about mathematics, which is what we're kind of talking about today. And you've written a number of wonderful books. And I, uh, there, I was going to, as I was going to your website, I was like, I definitely got to get my hands on some of these and, and go through them. But, you know, back to mathematics really fast here, where where is your field of study then? So eventually, you know, you got your bachelor's and you wanted to go on and get your yeah. PhD because maybe you had decided at some point you wanted to be a math professor. What aspect of mathematics is most appealing to you? Uh, well, my uh, thesis uh, was in logic and model theory. I mean, Bertrand Russell had always been an idol of mine even since uh, middle school uh, or junior high school as it was called in those days. <laughs> So, uh, and I knew he was a logician, or a kind of mathematician philosopher. So, uh, you know, I took the usual uh, sets of co graduate courses in mathematics and a variety of fields, but the, the thesis itself was in mathematical logic and model theory. Very interesting. I am I am familiar with Bertrand Russell, and I love uh, Russell the the Russell's teapot analogy, uh, which I think has. I'm sure that you're familiar with that. And perhaps some of the uh, people who are watching or listening to this uh, today are familiar with it as well, but it basically has to do with the, uh, the burden of proof, right? So if you're, if you're gonna make a claim about something, or I think that the thought experiment is something, suppose there's a teapot orbiting some distant planet or something like that, and you make a claim that, that it's so, yeah, yeah something yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. But that's, uh, it's really interesting. So if you're unfamiliar, I definitely uh, look it up if you're, yeah, well, um, it's also are... related to uh, uh, justified true belief not equaling knowledge. That's a kind of paradox. Gettier's par paradox. Uh, it used to be people kind of uncritically thought that if you believe something and you were justified in that belief and it was true, then you knew it. And that's not necessarily the case. There can be justified true beliefs that 
don't uh, you know, qualify as knowledge. Mm -hmm. So um, interesting. That's related to uh, teapots and related to some other stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, very interesting. All right, so you became a professor and uh, at some point you decided that you wanted to write books and you've, you've written a number of books. Um, and in particular, there was a very popular book that you wrote, I think it was in the late eighties called Enumeracy, Mathematical Literacy and Its Consequences. So I think a lot of the topics and correct me if I'm wrong here because I actually haven't read that book but from the reviews and from the description of that book, a number of the topics addressed in that particular book that you wrote are addressed in this new the new book that you've written who's counting um is that is that correct that, 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 there's there's a lot of that there's a lot of overlap there uh the, the, the same theme uh, kind of permeates uh, both or at least one one of several things in the book but uh that is that enumeracy the ability to deal comfortably with numbers probability logic and so on uh is uh, still a, a, a strong driver of bad policy, bad personal decisions, and, uh, and contributes to uh, all sorts of, uh, of uh, uh, mis <laughs> mis bad, let's just say, bad approaches to climate science, to uh, taxation, and so on. So uh, uh, I like to think of the numeracy as kind of cleansing, kind of united, uh, outlook that uh, many people probably all people including myself have about a lot of things but the mm -hmm. numeracy is kind of an astringent uh, and uh, and it's it's one of the basic reality principles uh, in, in the world I mean, if uh, you know, logic probability mathematics in general um, uh, guide our approach to the world and they're much better guides than our power and wealth um, which seems to be the case uh, case now. Is that why you felt the need to write this particular book? Is, is would you say that the, the for um, for numeracy you had a similar drive to write that book as you did this current book, Who's Counting? Uh, that you still have, yeah. Essentially, people not knowing how to interpret numbers or bad thinking influencing public policy in in a bad way. No, that's that's that is the case. I mean, and I yeah. remembered, uh, you know, the approximate uh, idea, cause for the idea to write the book. It was at a party, and it was uh, Friday night, and a lot of people talking, and the what the, the news came on, and the weather, which you know, people looked at it, which shows how uh, how uh, unenjoyable the party was. <laughs> Anyway, the announcer said that there was a 50% chance of rain for Saturday, which is Friday night, and a 50% chance on Sunday, and concluded therefrom that there was a 100% chance for the weekend. And nobody battered, battered an eye. And, uh, and it just struck me how innumerate, uh, to use the word, uh, most people are, even intelligent people I mean, who you know, can speak eloquently. Sometimes eloquence edges over into glibness. And, but uh and uh don't feel any shame for lack of a better term in the fact that they have uh they always quote hated math and mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the part of the reason they hate math is they have a very narrow uh view of what math is that it's just a matter of computation and uh, plugging formulas into numbers numbers into formulas but mathematics is a way of thinking it's much more to it than arithmetic so, uh, and it, as I say, it has a kind of imperialist uh, aspect that uh, does uh, uh, affect, infect uh, other modes of uh, knowledge. And um, so I wanted to uh, address these people who are quite intelligent, but never less enumerate. And I think that uh, even now, there are, I mean, things have changed a lot, and, uh, but in some sense, they stayed the same. Yes, yeah, certainly very important work, important work, and I, I couldn't agree more with uh, with what you were trying to do with your books here. Uh, real quick, I there was something that you said there about people not appreciate, appreciating mathematics, and 
I'm curious as if you think that the reason why people don't understand that mathematical thinking is powerful is because of the way that it's taught, like through the K through 12 education system, that it's more along the lines of taught of you just are plugging numbers into equation or pushing equations around and then something pops out versus it being taught as a way of thinking. Right. I mean, uh, uh, something I, I've written in a couple of books, it's a uh, book online, and I'm cited many times as a, the author of this quotation, but it, it, it is the following, that uh, computa- mathematics is no more computation than uh, literature is typing. I mean, you don't say, wow, you're a great typist, you should write a novel, or wow, you're a horrible typist, uh, give up your uh, writing. But people in math, I mean, not, uh, too many people think of math as, as you just described it, just a matter of plugging numbers into formulas, and uh, that's it. It has, so unfortunately, that, that uh, very narrow, myopic view of the subject is is off-putting, and, and it's partly the way it's taught. I mean, uh, there's still too much emphasis on both. I mean, there there are lots of improvements. I mean, uh, the emphasis in schools on STEM and connections to computer science and other areas it is stressed more and that's that's welcome i mean there are lots of apps and uh, approaches so things are, are better in a sense but there's still a huge number of millions of people who are innocent of you know, anything beyond arithmetic do you do you think that it has more to do with like the fact that earlier on, it seems like, and I'm, I, I do have a bachelor's degree in mathematics, but it's more of the applied, applied mathematics than pure. And I'm just looking, I'm kind of going through and looking back at my own education through K through 12. And then even in college when I was working towards my degree. And it seems as though maybe the preference is for application or computation versus actually pure mathematics. So, cause I remember, yeah, being trained in applied or computational mathematics. So just pushing numbers around or solving equations and not really understanding how to think like a mathematician until I got higher to higher levels of mathematics. And in my applied route, I only had to take a few proof courses, but it was really in those courses that I learned to think more like a mathematician. Whereas with the applied, I just kind of knew how to use the machinery of mathematics to spit out numbers at the end to get it to work. And of course, I had some training from science, too, that helped me to think more critically. But I'm just kind of looking at the mathematical curriculum and the idea of thinking more like a mathematician. I think it only happens really when you, but and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm interested in what you think, what, what your thoughts are, but when you're studying the pure mathematics. So I'm talking about the proof courses. I think uh, people sometimes make uh, uh, stress the distinction too much. I mean, uh, you never know what part of pure mathematics, will be, so-called pure mathematics, will become useful. And lots of applied mathematics is, is, is mathematics. It, 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 if you look at uh, the formal aspects of it, how, where it comes from, it, it's, it's pure. So, I mean, the distinction between pure and applied is at best hazy. And, um, okay. and um, that's fair. It's, uh, you know, both are, are important. I mean, you, you want to apply mathematics. I mean, it's part of the ma- major part of the rationale for studying it. There, there's a, a well-known mathematician, uh, G.H. Hardy, from more than 100 years ago. He was a number theorist in, uh, in Britain, and he, had a, he was devoted to pure mathematics, number theory in particular. And, uh, you know, one uh, of his... Uh, uh, students or uh, uh, mentors, Ramanujan, who was both a student and a mentor, since he had this amazing ability to see connections, the weird connections between you know, numbers E and pi, infant series. Anyway, uh, he hardly focused only on that, on pure, very, very pure number theory. In fact, he wrote a memoir and called the a Mathematician's Apology, in which he kind of he rides all applied mathematics things. That's just uh, cookbook stuff. And uh, there was once a review of his uh, memoir, Mathematicians of 
anthology that was very short, succinct, and withering. It said uh, about his book, uh, it was, uh, the review was written by an applied mathematician. And he says, Hardy's book, uh, for, what did he say? Something from such uh, cloistered clowning, the world sickens. <laughs> so uh, Hardy was accused of being a clown, and cloistered, and, uh, and so he, in a sense, got back at Hardy. But um, in any case, uh, to get back to the main point, I, I think you can make a little too much of a distinction between pure and applied math. I mean, as I say, I mean, given uh, talking about number theory, and there's nothing more pure than number theory. Yes, uh, yet it's now the basis of um, you know, uh, cryptography, transferring trillions of dollars across oceans instantaneously, and uh, unbreakable codes or uh, almost unbreakable codes. And um, so, number theory, pure subject, is now very essential to modern finance. Absolutely essential. So, in any case. And end of, end of sermon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely think that's fair what you said there about the distinction be between pure implied mathematics being fuzzy. Um, yeah, that's de that's definitely a fair. I guess I, I was more talking about like the proof based courses and things like that where you had to really. Yeah, all right. Yeah. You just think differently. Uh, to yeah, me, when right. I was taking more of like, let's say, the calculus courses, just the elementary calculus courses or differential equations, the type of thinking that I employed there was different. Than the thinking that I apply to my proof proof based courses, such as um, let's say linear algebra or the higher level level calculuses, yeah. where it was um, where it's more it's called analysis. So as you know, analysis. Um, I just thought differently. I guess my type of thinking was different. Well, uh, mathematics, uh, you, know, you might liken to a mansion that has lots of rooms, and uh, in different rooms it's done differently. And just as uh, uh, literature, not just literature, writing in general, that many roomed um, mansion. In some rooms, you write novels, others poetry, others advertising copy, others laundry lists. I mean, it's all writing and it's all math, but you know, in, in different contexts, different parts of the mansion's rooms are utilized. That's an interesting analogy. I've never thought, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> Very interesting. All right, so your book, Who's Counting? Uh, it starts off with some wonderful puzzles. And I like overall how the book was written because there's a bunch of basically, each chapter has a particular kind of genre to it. And then there are a number of different stories that you give. And um, yeah, I just like the narrative form of it overall. And is your, is your, right, is, what's that? I said, thanks, I appreciate that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you normally write like that? Most uh, of your books are in yeah. narrative form? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'd say it's, uh, I find it at least to reach a, a wide audience. I mean, you mostly was bestseller, New York Times bestseller for five and a half months. So, uh, so I, I want to reach the people who quote, hate math. And uh, one way of doing that is to get ideas across using uh, stories, vignettes, jokes, parables, uh, rather than formulas. The formulas and equations that might be implicit in the story, but they're not explicit. And so, uh, yeah, I, I always like to you know, explain ideas via little stories and uh, anecdotes, and, and sometimes personal, some, most of the time now. But, uh, in fact, I wrote a book, I think, therefore I laugh, uh, which is an illustration of a remark by Wittgenstein, a philosopher who once uh, opined that you could write a, a serious book in philosophy that consisted entirely of jokes. If you get the joke, you get the relevant philosophical point. And where joke is interpreted very broadly from I mean, joke, uh, I mean, formal joke or parable, anecdote, uh, humorous situation, whatever. But uh, so that book is kind of attempts at least to be an illustration of Wittgenstein's claim that you can write a philosophy book that consists of entirely joke. But uh, joke being a kind of, uh, again, uh, this connection between stories and statistics or narratives and numbers, um, puzzles are a kind of narrative. And um, in any case, so- uh, You're not I think I think it's wonderful personally, and 
you know, as a, so obviously mathematics is a harder subject for many people and they don't really understand the importance of it. As we talked about earlier from the traditional education system, they think it's just pushing equations around out of method of thinking. And what I love about the stories is it really helps to kind of break apart this harder subject and make it more digestible uh, like for the average. Yeah. At least I found it really enjoyable. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's, yeah. that's good to hear. I mean, I, I, I do try to vivify the, the mathematical symbols and not, not just this book, who's counting, but mm -hmm. most of my other books. So at the beginning of the book, there is an entire chapter on puzzles. And one of the puzzles that kind of stuck out in my mind is the uh, famous Monty Hall puzzle. So perhaps we could dig into a little bit on that. So the original Monty Hall problem is the following, based on a TV show. And um, the setup is the following. There are three doors and a host and a contestant. And the mm -hmm. host informs the contestant that behind one of the doors is a car, a brand new car. And behind the other two doors, nothing, or maybe a movie box. So, so uh, the doors are closed. The host asks the contestant to pick a door, one, two, or three. And if you pick correctly, you get what's behind it. And so let's say the contestant picks door two. Then the host, who, all, who knows where the car is, opens one of the doors behind which there's nothing. He never reveals where the car is. So the, host, the contestant has, for example, picked door two. It works the same way if you he or she picked one of the other two doors. So contestant picks door two, the, the host knows where the car is, opens one of the doors behind which there's nothing. So now there's two closed doors, the one that the contestant originally picked and another one, and the host asks the contestant, do you want to switch? Do you want to switch your bet before I reveal where it is? And um, the right uh, reaction, uh, the, uh, the right move is to, is to switch. Many people don't though. They say, well, there's two doors. Chances are 50-50 that the car is behind one of them. And I, I picked door two. So it's 50-50 chance I might as well stay. But that's not the right way to look at the problem. The right, it's not much wrong. I mean, the chance that you picked the right door originally is one third. The probability the car is behind one of the other two doors is two thirds. So uh, it remains two thirds that is behind one of the other two doors. So when it, the host opens the door behind which there's nothing, this two thirds probability is now focused on the, the one unopened, the other unopened door, not the one the contestant shows. So there's one third chance originally, two thirds chance it's one of the other two doors and uh, he opens one door, so there's nothing there. So the two thirds probability now attaches to the other unopened door, not the one the contestant picked. So if you, you should switch and then your probability of winning goes from one third to two thirds. You double your chances of, of winning if you, uh, if you switch. Uh, but many people find that counterintuitive. You can make it more intuitive if you have a 10 doors and you pick one door. <laughs> And uh, the, the host opens eight other doors behind which there's nothing. He never reveals a car. Now, do you want to switch? Uh, and the chance, now it seems more plausible that you should switch. Uh, but in any case, I, I, I look at a, a variant of it that's uh, less uh, innocuous, that's more malign. A, in this case, there's another, there's another host, not Monty Hall, but Tonty Hall. And the same setup. But behind one of the three doors is uh, a, a gas jet that spews out toxic gas, whoever opens it. <laughs> and behind the other two doors, there's nothing. So the, uh, in this situation, the, uh, the contestant picks the door, whichever door it is, and the host, Taunty Hill, Hall, opens up, I should say Hill, Hell rather, but Taunty Hall opens up one of the doors behind which there's nothing and asks if you should switch. And now you should not switch because uh, there's two thirds probability that uh, the toxic gas is when one of the other two doors, not the one you picked, one thirds of probability of toxic gas comes out of the door you picked, two thirds probability is one of the other two doors. 
the host opens the door behind which there is nothing. So now that two thirds probability attaches to the other unopened door, not the one you picked. So if you switch them, you have two thirds probability that you'll be spewed, um, that this toxic gas will spew out at you. So you should stay where you are in this case, because you want to avoid this. You don't want to win a car, you, you don't want to lose uh, your health or whatever. And um, I mean, there's some re resonance with the COVID policy to limit the number of people you're exposed to. If instead of three doors, there were a hundred, uh, it's better to focus on one door. I mean, to choose one door and not, not switch to whatever unopened doors there are because your chances of losing, getting sprayed with uh, a toxic gas is whatever it is, one over the number of doors. Whereas if you switch, you in a sense, get uh, the probability of you being exposed to toxic gas and goes from one third to two thirds or more if you've got more doors. So anyway, it, it, it may be hard to uh, you know, picture with that uh, brief uh, account, but uh, like a lot of puzzles, it, it has some real world analogs. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the puzzles, oh, it's just a little puzzle. But in some sense, this is a, provides a rationale for limiting your, your exposure to, to people during the, the pandemic. So, and then many of the other puzzles I, I talk about, the, the puzzles are appealing in themselves, but they often have some implications for social policy as well. And of course, there's much more in the book besides puzzles. Puzzles is just the first of seven chapters, but many things. Yeah, yeah no, it's really interesting that with the Monty Hall puzzle is that it actually has real world application, like you said. So yeah, that's a neat, neat aspect of it. And also the reason why I like it is because I was stumped by it the first time that I came across it. Not going to lie. Yeah, <laughs> it's not quite as obvious. And I'm openly not the best with statistics, which is, a, <laughs> which, uh, which is something that I'm continuing to work on. And I think that the average person is not the best statistician either. And no. we, can get, we can get more into that later, but yeah, definitely this this has a statistical component to it and kind of understanding how the doors are open and what it means and how it shifts the probability. So, yeah. but very interesting puzzle. And uh, something else that was brought up uh, towards the beginning of the book is you talk about scaling. And I am fascinated by the topic of scaling because a couple of years ago, I actually read uh, Geoffrey West's book City. scale yeah and you actually talk about him and the work that he did with some other scientists um, in at the beginning of the book but yeah I'm, I just find scaling fascinating and learning about how scaling works uh, particularly in biological systems yeah but I mean, but uh, most basic is even just uh, you know start out with the common example of pizza if you have a pizza that's five inches in diameter and another one that's 10 inches in, in diameter. Uh, the bigger one isn't, doesn't give you twice the pizza, it gives you four times the pizza because you, the area scales up with the square of the diameter. Yeah. And uh, same thing with the drinks, uh, uh, you, you have a cup with the same uh, radius, uh, one's twice the high, with, you know, that scales up with the cube of the height. So uh, things that work on small levels with, don't don't scale in cities, as you just mentioned. He talks about the scaling factors uh, that uh, you know, just because you double the area of a city, some, some uh, the uh, diameter of a city, so to speak, uh, that leads to all kinds of features regarding you know, uh, the infrastructure and so on, biological systems as well, or even just painting, uh, painting a house. I mean, if you, uh, if you paint uh, the outside of the house, that scales up with the square of, the, uh, of its length and width. If you were to fill up a house with paint, that squares <laughs> with the cube of the house, or length and height, width and depth. But, uh, and in politics, that plays a role. I mean, uh, people who have some small com company, it works, oh, this, is, this policy is amazing. But then when a company grows and it's 10 times as great, the policy doesn't work anymore because it, uh, it doesn't scale. Or, and same thing with, uh, with governments. A small, a small town might be quite governable with uh, 
But uh, when it's uh, 10 times as large, uh, all kinds of cracks in the policy become apparent because uh, its consequences don't scale net, don't scale linearly. Mm -hmm. We always assume linear scaling, but that's not the case. Sometimes it's fractional scaling as well. Yeah, it's definitely more complex than the average person thinks uh, thinks of. And admittedly, I didn't know that when you scaled areas and volumes, that they scale differently than linear scaling until I took a mathematical modeling course where we did an entire chapter about scaling. Oh, and cool. yet solving problems and like how do you properly scale things when you're talking about more than one dimension. And as you said, when you scale areas, which are two dimensions, it scales with the square. And then when you go to three dimensions, it scales as the cube. Yeah. So you very quickly run into problems, which is something that you address in the book too here, uh, particularly the biological component, like why can't you have certain animals that are larger than what we currently observe today? And this is something that is addressed in Geoffrey West's book, right. uh, Scale as well. It's because you very, very quickly run into like these crazy limitations just because of how volumes scale. Right, I mean, you, you can't have King Kong because uh, yeah. you have a, a gorilla that's 10 times the normal gorilla. Its weight scales up with the with, uh, third degree of its height, with the third power of its height. Whereas what holds the gorilla up is a cross section of, his, of the gorilla's uh, legs or back, which squares with uh, the square of the relevant dimension, the, the height, let's take that as a basic dimension. So uh, he's going to be much heavier than his, uh, he, his or her supporting uh, legs or back, which only go up with the square of the height. So he's going to collapse. That's why you don't have trees that are that tall either for the same reason. Um, but yeah, scaling is, a, is an easy idea, but has uh, amazingly pervasive consequences. Yeah, I remember in particular there was one example because you were talking about why you can't have uh, why you can't have animals the size of King Kong or gorillas the size of King Kong and trees yeah. bigger than what we observe today. Is I think in Geoffrey West's book, he uses the example of Godzilla, and uh, you couldn't yeah you definitely couldn't have something that gigantic just because with these scaling laws or even your King Kong example yeah it would just it would just collapse like the legs would give out you couldn't create you couldn't create bones that would be large enough to support a structure that large it just is not feasible yeah, that, that's why animals that are very heavy have such wide legs I mean hippopotami you know, you know tree trunk legs elephants have you know thick legs they don't have spindly little legs. And uh, so even then, yep. they, they're very bad at sprinting and high jump. <laughs> and, you know, you're talking about like, like public policy, politics, uh, corporations and how they scale and then the kind of laws that govern them change. I remember an example in particular that you used was healthcare. So I think that oftentimes what you have is people who take better healthcare systems, like let's use the United States for an example, better healthcare systems than the United States that work in other countries, and I'm openly uh, guilty of this, is saying, okay, well, for example, let's, let's take a European country like Denmark or Switzerland or something like that, where you have a fraction of the population and a far more homogenous population as well. And then, well, let's take that system and bring it over to the United States because it works so well there, it's so much better on a number of metrics. So we should use it here in the United States and it would be, and then we would have better healthcare outcomes. And the argument that you make in your book is, well, you're not, when, when you're using an argument like that, you're not taking scaling into account. Right. And most people have no idea what scaling is. It's not like it's a difficult concept, but I mean, it's just one instance of how enormity, uh, which seems in a way like a minor, to many people, a minor problem really has significant impact because, I mean, you know, you adopt a policy because it works in uh, Liechtenstein, it's not going to work in uh, <laughs> the United States. Do you think, though, that to some degree, it could be used as a model and then therefore, you know, taking into account scaling and things like that, like it may not look the exact same, but saying, hey, maybe there's some things that we could we could experiment with. Oh, I mean, yeah. I know that, yeah, like you can't 
scale things exactly, but saying, okay, well, um, over here, there are a number of policies that work very well. And while they may not look the same exactly uh, here, um, again, I'll use the United States. In the United States, maybe we could experiment with them and then tweak them and see how we could make them optimally work given our situation. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, you have to do that. Make do. I mean, cities grow organically. Man. Nobody imposes uh, all the rules at first. I mean, it's one mistake that uh, um, creationists uh, make. Uh, and say, how could you have uh, this or that? I uh, mean, uh, look at the human eye or some particular physiological process would depend on a uh, sequence of events and that they'd all have to come together in order for the blood to move or the eye to see. But it doesn't happen sequentially. It happens via evolution, of course. Uh, yeah. so, I mean, the same people who are creationists don't bat an eye when they look at a complex city uh, and they don't say, well, how come you can go into any store in the city and get a Snickers bar or, or the, uh, these kind, this kind of jeans or that kind of sweatshirt or, or go on Amazon and get uh, whatever? Uh, how did that happen? Did it all come out? Uh, you know, some great economic lawgiver just decided to put Snickers in all these stores? No, it happens gradually. So same people who think that you know, animals can't uh, uh, can't exist because uh, without divine intervention or divine creation, uh, but it happens gradually. The evolution, mm -hmm. same way cities uh, uh, are as complex as they are, not because they happen all at once, but because it grew organically and evolved. If you want to use that verb for cities. Yeah, really interesting. I think I think there was an example around this time too. You're talking about how things grow organically, and it it goes back to scaling. You're I think you use an example of um, mice mice versus rats, and where they branched off in the family tree. And then originally, um, there were biologists who thought that it happened 40 million years ago. But then if you look at the fossil record, it happened much sooner than that. Like it happened 12 million, and it was because of these scaling laws in biology, where small the smaller the animal, the higher the meta metabolic rate. Right. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. So that uh, you're using different metrics, and uh, you can reconcile it um, by referring to the heartbeat or metabolic rate. Yeah, it's it's just all very interesting how you have um, yeah, how these scaling laws manifest themselves. And yeah, as you said, too, with the complexity and uh, with the creationism, uh, just these these things happen over large timescales. And you may not question the um, the city, which is kind of modeled almost like an organism, a growing a growing organism or close to it. it. It obeys some scaling laws. You may not question that because it makes sense to you, the complexity there. Um, again, this is what you just said with uh, the creation of our creationism arguments, uh, but then you look at animals and then right. you have a lot of questions and, you know, you're invoking, invoking intelligent design arguments and things like that. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah well, as you can tell, I'm not a fan of such arguments. Yeah, I can <laughs> tell. I, I can tell. All right. So probability. Uh, as I had alluded to earlier, I am not the best with probability. You have devoted an entire section of your book to probability because I think that it's fair to say that many individuals are not good with uh, good with probabilities. And uh, in particular, the chapter that you devoted to probabilities in the book starts off with Bayes' theorem, which I think is really interesting and is a great way of just kind of moving through life from a thinking standpoint. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the people's uh, vocabulary, a lot of people's vocabulary regarding probability is very limited. It's limited to like three terms, like one in a million for something rare, 50-50 <laughs> or something might happen, or a sure thing if it's definitely going to happen. But, but with regard to Bayes' theorem, I, or probability in general, it's kind of a refinement of everyday things, uh, everyday ways of thinking. Uh, 
but it's refined and made more precise if more precision as possible. I mean, a simple example, you have two coins in front of you. One is a regular fair coin, the other is a two-headed coin. Okay, pick a coin, and the probability that you picked a fair coin is a half, because there's two coins. But if uh, before that, uh, somebody picks one of the coins and flips it three times and it comes up heads, three times, then the probability that it's a fair coin is no longer a half, but it's eight ninths. We can do a little calculation regarding the formal apparatus of base theorem. So it's initially the probability that you pick a fair coin is a half, but if the coin you, you pick is flipped three times and it comes up heads all three times, you have to change your estimate of the probability from one half to one ninth. Why one ninth? That comes from uh, Bayes' rule. But I mean, people do that informally. They don't get one ninth, but they realize, oh, no, if you got to you know, flip the coin, the one you picked came up heads three times, it's probably less likely to be a fair coin. But in more complicated situations, uh, your intuition, your intu intuition fails us and we make some silly decisions. Also, as regard to um, conditional probability, the probability of something given something else. I mean, one example I talk about in the book is the prosecutor's paradox, uh, which is, um, that, that, let's say uh, some crime is committed and uh, the, uh, the perpetrator is noticed, uh, it's noted that that per perpetrator has large feet, wears a, a dirty t-shirt, long hair, uh, had on, uh, was in an area where there are a lot of people on a certain park bench. And then you uh, arrest somebody. And uh, if uh, the probability of an innocent person, uh, the probability of all this evidence being true of an innocent person is, uh, is small. You know, here's this person you just arrested, he was wandering around in the same area. The probability of all this evidence being arrayed, uh, being true of this innocent person, all there was probability of evidence given innocence could be small. But what's even smaller is the other way around, probability of innocence given all this evidence. So what do you mean all this evidence? Well, what if there's like 10 people who was a busy weekend afternoon who had those traits, people going back and forth across this bench, a lot of people, had big feet and dirty t-shirts, long hair, whatever. So given the evidence there, given the evidence, the probability the person you arrested is innocent is much higher. If there's 10 such people, it's now one tenth. So prosecutors emphasize the former conditional probability. I realize it's kind of hard to follow them, you know, uh, but if you could write on a board, <laughs> there, there's a board here. Uh, with, and think about it, but uh, the probability of the evidence given innocence is much smaller than the probability of innocence given evidence. The prosecutor will emphasize the probability of evidence uh, given innocence, and the defense attorney will emphasize the other conditional probability. So the way the conditional probability works is not always clear. I mean, the probability that somebody is uh, a male given that um, uh, He's the C. Uh, the person is a CEO. What's the probability the person's a male given that person's the CEO of a large company? Um, that's very high. A lot of, most CEOs are male. Well, what about the other way around? Uh, what's the probability of being CEO given you're a male? Well, that's very low. Very few males are president of head, you know, large uh, corporations. Probability of CEO given male is very small, but the probability of male given being a CEO is very large. So, I mean, it's, it's just a difference between if A then B and if B then A, but uh, expressed in probabilistic terms, the conditional probability is different and sometimes very significant. Yeah, I think that, that I think this distinction is incredibly important and many people fail to realize that. Um, it's just kind of mixing up. You're you're mixing you're mixing up the ca causation with uh, a, almost like co correlation. It's almost uh, mi mixing these uh, mixing, like you said, mixing up the um, 
the condition yeah mi mixing yeah. up the condition like a a a b versus b a right and uh, people do it all the time yet another instance where you know public policy uh, is um uh, misguided public public policy is driven by uh misunderstandings and numerous things and often it, it's not like uh, some abstruse uh, notion in algebraic topology or or some you know, uh, Bonnach spaces or whatever. It's generally it's uh, it depends on misunderstanding some basic notions and probability and logic and uh, sometimes some higher level stuff, uh, fixed point terms or whatever. But most of the time, just probability, logic, uh, common sense, and a, a certain degree of, uh, of of skepticism. I mean, a reliance on evidence, but um, insistence on seeing the evidence. Uh, so, and people are um, a little too gullible. I, 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 I taught a course once in, uh, in Thailand, and uh, it was a short course, and it was big. And uh, I, you know, it was mainly uh, nurses, and it was just like a, a three day course, in probably, I guess. And uh, I would say something, and the students would uh, go nod their heads, ka, ka, which means okay, and uh, that's the way the woman in this course, ka, ka. And then I realized they had made a mistake on the board, and I wrote that, and I noticed they were still nodding, and then I did it again on purpose, and, and then I started writing all kinds of nonsense on the board, and I got the same reaction, ka, ka, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I realized that, you know, that they weren't Thinking, I mean, I was, uh, you know, this uh, foreign professor that they were told to uh, be nice to. I don't know what the reason was, or uh, be uh, overly respectful. And uh, you know, this was an extreme case, and it's not just Thailand; this country too, and it's not all of Thailand, obviously. But um, you know, people want to be agreeable most of the time. Uh, and uh, they just agree to things, or they uh, you know, heard uh, heard beliefs, heard behavior, and uh, you know, I'm trying to call that gullibility fine. Uh, but um, I mean, and in general, I mean, uh, as as you well know, uh, cognitive foibles play a big big role in people's belief system, not just mathematical feelings, but uh, you know, the availability error and uh, anchoring effect and. Uh, confirmation bias and a whole host of common um, uh, cognitive failings that also underlie a lot of our uh, decisions. In fact, there, there, there's one that has less, uh, is less widely known, it's called a conjunction fallacy. And that's that the probability, and let me give you an example instead of stating what it is. Let's say there's a, a US senator who's a very good guy, he's very honest, he's a, uh, uh, lives uh, modestly with his wife and daughter who's, uh, who's sick. And um, he, you know, a, a picture of rectitude. And um, okay, so that's the senator. It's called Senator Jones. Given this background of Senator Jones, what's more likely that he accepted a bribe from a lobbyist or B, he accepted a bribe from a lobbyist uh, and spent the money to uh, pay for his daughter's operation. Well, most people, might, or a lot of people at least, uh, many people uh, would choose the second one. Oh yeah, well, he's the guy, he have done it, his daughter's sick. But actually the first option is more likely, just the accepted money from a lobbyist, period. That's more likely than that he accepted money from a lobbyist and used it to pay for his, his daughter's operation. Why? Because the probability of one event being true is always greater than the probability of two events being true, or three or four. There's often a trade-off. I mean, the, the probability of two events being true is smaller. There's often a trade-off between probability and plausibility. You can make your story more plausible by putting in lots of details. Yeah, uh, but it becomes less probable, and uh, and the internet is full of all kinds of factoids that you can weave into some ridiculous story like PizzaGate or any QAnon um, uh, claim, and so you can 
uh, you know, weave it together and uh, you can make it seem superficially plausible and people will believe it. And there are lots of reasons for fake news and whatever. Yeah, the, uh, the conjunction fallacy, I think, is a very common foible. And I, I know that I was most likely falling victim to that until I even learned about the conjunction fallacy, just because it, it seems to be ubiquitous. And I think a lot of people fall for that one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I mean, there, yeah. there, it's some, and it's hard to avoid. I mean, everybody, no matter how uh, you know, skeptical you are or how intelligent you are, educated, that uh, you know, these, these foibles uh, sneak up on you and um, and you find yourself, oh, wait, that doesn't make any sense. How could I believe that? <laughs> I think it speaks to the power of ed education in this area too, though, because once I've learned about these like cognitive biases, and I certainly don't know all of them, but once I learned, for example, we were just talking about the conjunction fallacy. Once I learned about the conjunction fallacy, then I know to look out for it. And yeah, no, what, yeah. That, that, that's true. I mean, I think... Uh, uh, talking about these to, in class, you don't have to be, have a course in psychology, but a lot of these can be illustrated uh, with uh, you know, little vignettes, and then you can look for them in daily life. Uh, people make this mistake all the time, these kinds of mistakes all the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, so one more topic that I'd like to discuss about probability because uh, I think it's really important. I think a lot of people get confused about it. And again, I've certainly got confused about it in the past is relative risk versus absolute risk. Yeah. And this has this played a role in the uh, in the pandemic as well. So let's go ahead and explore that topic a little bit. OK, and the, the distinction is fairly straightforward. Yeah, that, that, let's say um, your absolute risk of suffering from some kind of uh, kidney cancer is uh, before a certain age is um, two in, a, in 5,000, two in 5,000, pick that, that number out of the air. But let's say you, you, uh, you engage in some activity that raises your risk uh, of 50%. And you see the headline, if you drink or eat whatever, bacon, uh, your risk of kidney cancer will go up uh, 50%. Uh, uh, and what that means, it'll go, it'll go from two per two to five, three. <laughs> from, from two to 5,000 to three to 5,000. So um, the absolute risk is still very low. It went from two and 5,000 to three and 5,000. It's a change in absolute risk. But the relative risk is uh, 50%, it, an increase of 50%. Uh, and uh, all there are lots of, I mean, even COVID, I mean, people don't understand false positives. Anytime you check for a rare condition, whether it's having uh, COVID or being a terrorist or looking for somebody with certain conditions, any, anything that's rare, uh, the probability of a false positive is going to be very high. And um, in fact, uh, for any uh, diseases, I mean, they give these kinds of puzzles to doctors they say, yeah, if you have this cancer, you're, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a rare cancer. If you have it, they'll test positive 95% of the time. If you don't have it, they'll test positive 2% of the time. And, and people say, well, okay, you've got it. Uh, you, you tested positive. You have the disease. Most doctors get that wrong uh, well, at, uh, without doing a calculation. Uh, most of the positive tests will be false positives. And uh, so again, when you test for a rare condition, if it's a reasonably reliable test, you should be careful that you're not uh, uh, getting a false positive result. And you gotta worry about false negatives too, of course. I mean, uh, doctor's saying you're fine and then you go home and drop dead three days later. But um, so medicine is right for such uh, you know, mathematical misunderstandings. Yeah, I think it's very common there. And many people fall victim to listening to relative risks versus absolute, because it's more advantageous, for example, if you're a pharmaceutical company, and you're trying to sell your next wonder drug, and you realize that from all of the studies, you are making a difference with the drug, but the absolute risk doesn't look that great. Going back to your example, you're going from, let's say, 
to uh, two in 5,000 to three in 5,000, or, or you're lowering it from two to one, let's yeah. say, but then you're going to then promote it on the relative risk saying right. that you're going to, you know, you get a 50% boost there or something like that. And I, I just find it remarkably disingenuous and the, the average person doesn't really realize what's going on. So they just, yeah, think it's and, and, and then the doctors are out there promoting it. So, and they, these things work even if, uh, I mean, sometimes often they escape your critical, uh, uh, capabilities. I mean, even such a ridiculously trivial thing as saying that uh, this sells for, uh, nine, uh, eight ninety five. Uh, it sells for nine dollars, I and mean, everybody knows eight ninety five and nine dollars is most is not a significant dis difference. But yet it does have a psychological effect that you're not even you know you dismiss. Oh, how could I be influenced by that? But we've done studies that show that it does make a, a difference. So, um, yeah, the marketers yeah, wouldn't do it if there wasn't evidence that it worked. Yeah, I mean, every, everything <laughs> is always ninety nine, twenty nine ninety nine, or thirty five. 96, 95, uh, but I mean, that, that, that's hardly you know, high level stuff, but it's effective and it, it's, it's almost invisible because you're so uh, accustomed to that. But it, even that trivial little uh, sleight of hand uh, makes a difference. I've always wondered how, I've, how I'm being influenced by that, to be honest with you, because I know that when I see something for $9.99 in my mind, I'm thinking $10, but I'm like, is there something more going on there? that I'm not aware of. I think there like, are studies that yeah. show that, I mean, it's, it's statistically significant, maybe not uh, a huge effect, but it uh, is statistically significant. People would much, much rather get the one for 8.95 than one for $9. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I've just, I mean- I, I'm, I'm not sure what the price of my book uh, <laughs> next month. I, I, I'm not sure, it, it might have a, I don't know what it is at 95 cents at the end. But, uh, it probably uh, is. I mean, I, I know that when I wrote a book a couple of years ago, I mean, I, I did the same thing just because that's kind of what you do. That's how you price things. So you want it to be, yeah. I suppose, unless you wanted to be a bit of an outlier and do yeah. something, go, go against the grain. So if instead of listing a book for $9.99, you list it for $10 even. Or, or even worse. I mean, instead of... Uh, uh, eight ninety five. Uh, make it uh, nine dollars and ten cents. There you go. Okay. <laughs> or nine dollars and a penny, or something. Or nine dollars and a penny. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I hope they. Uh, I should know the price of my uh, who's counting, but uh, it. Uh, I, I should look it up. Um, I, I think it does end in ninety five cents. So it probably so. does. It's probably ninety five or ninety nine or eighty nine or something like that. Something yeah. close to the next dollar amount, yeah. but just under. <laughs> it's just how things are priced. Yeah. Yeah. So society definitely doesn't understand probabilities to the to the same uh, to the same degree that uh, that you do, and I certainly don't either. Uh, it's something that uh, that I'm working on. But there is an, a really interesting section in your book all about politics, and in particular, you're talking about partisanship um, and politics, and. I'd like to pull that apart a little bit. And I guess we could start off talking about Wolf's Law, uh, which is something that you, uh, you expound upon quite a bit in the, uh, in the chapter there. Okay, Wolf's Dilemma is uh, related to, but not the same as the Prisoner's Dilemma. And it partially explains the, the lockstep nature of, in, at least in recent years, of Republicans who stick together. And here's, uh, let me talk uh, the puzzle first. And there's some beneficent millionaire who enters that yeah, he's in front of a classroom that's saying it's a bunch of people, students or others in the classroom. And he, he promises each of them $100,000 if they restrain from pressing, secretly pressing a button on their desk for 10 minutes. So if nobody presses the button uh, on their desk, it's secrets, so nobody knows what they're doing. For 10 minutes, they'll each get $100,000. But if any one of them does secretly press the button, the one pressing the button will get $10,000. And those who don't press the button will get nothing, zero. So um, 
there's clearly an incentive to refrain from pressing the button. But some people may do it anyway because they don't trust the other people in the, in the room. Uh, they think one or, one or more of them might press a button and then I'll be left with nothing. So I better press the button and at least get my $10,000. So, I mean, uh, so in a way it enforces uh, uh, herd behavior. Uh, the analogy to Republicans is that if they all hang together, in other words, don't press the button on the desk, so to speak, in order to maintain loyalty, there'll be a big benefit. They'll win the presidency, they'll get reelected, because uh, that's what most politicians want. So there's this huge prize getting reelected if they hang together. But if they don't, if at least one person doesn't, breaks ranks, uh, that person uh, might destroy everything. They, that person will, will get some momentary smaller benefit, will be lionized by liberal press, let's say, but that'll only last for a week. And it might create a, a big uh, uh, well, wall hole in uh, uh, party unity and may lead to a cascade of other defections. In any case, uh, people will be much less likely to get anything, they might lose their re-election campaign. Anyway, um, so that, that's Wolf's dilemma, and uh, I relate it also, well, I also talk about uh, Trump's many uh, lies and horrible uh, actions, and, um, and fake news, there's a discussion of fake news, a long discussion. In fact, I, there's a, a quote I like that I, I mentioned in the book, it's uh, by Mark Twain. He said, uh, people are much easier to con than they are to convince that they've been conned. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, that's the case. I mean, it's kind of a case of political thermodynamics, uh, second law of thermal political dynamics. And um, it's related to what's called the asymmetry bullshit principle again. It's <laughs> <laughs> and um, so uh, Baldini's law, and uh, so anyway, I related to various uh, paradoxes as well as certain standard mathematical issues in uh, in politics, like gerrymandering on the state and local level. Actually, the the biggest gerrymander of all is constitutionally mandated, and that's that every state gets two U.S. senators. So you can look at half a dozen states: in North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Idaho, and um, uh, there's about six of them uh, whose population, the sum of whose populations is very low, but they get 24 senators, uh, 12 senators, six states that get 12 senators, and their combined population is much lower than that of California, which only gets two senators. So uh, that's, the, in a way, the biggest gerrymander of all. It's why the Republicans remain, uh, you know, uh, 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 in, in power or to have undue influence in uh, rural, sparsely populated states. And I talk about ranked voting, which also has a mathematical component and uh, some jokes and so on. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I found the entire chapter to be very interesting. And in particular, I was a little bit saddened by Arrow's, uh, Arrow's theorem, which basically yeah. said that you can't devise any, because you had mentioned ranked choice there, you can't devise any sort of voting system that won't be gamed eventually. Yeah, I mean, there's some are better than others, but uh, but every everyone, as you said, is capable of being gamed and uh, is likely to after a while. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a little bit disappointing. Um, so I was hoping that I was, but I mean, I'm sure that mathematicians and other people have looked at this problem for a long time. And well, the theorem wouldn't exist if it uh, if it couldn't be proved, right? Yeah, but which doesn't mean that some systems aren't better. Rank voting, yeah, given the present situation, it is better than not going to take off. And so, um, and there, you know, there's Condorcet board accounts, various other ways so forth, that are good in certain situations. And uh, yeah, Kenneth Arrow's uh, theorem. Economics. I think he got the Nobel Prize for it. I mean, it's a oh, wow. relatively simple result, at least to state. Yeah. Very you know, interesting. Just on certain very basic uh, 
uh, constraints on a, on a voting system. One is that they're not the dictator, and and a few a few others uh, then you get uh, as a result. Yeah, I could I could definitely tell too from this um, from this chapter that. Uh, you weren't the biggest fan of our uh, ex-president or our previous president. Wow, oh, how did you think that? <laughs> <laughs> so that's too funny. And I, I liked what you talked a little bit there about like outrage fatigue and uh, denial of service attacks as well when yeah. it came to some of the previous president's strategies of just kind of being overwhelmed. You briefly, you mentioned there the bullshit asymmetry principle or Brandolini's law and how you can just become overwhelmed with all of this just false information and then eventually just kind of throw your hands up and like i'm done it like is. whatever it's yeah a pile of service uh the computers if it's pinged too many times simultaneously it just shuts down and to some extent that happens people become numb and oh that's just trump going on steam or whatever I mean, yeah. so anybody else do one tiny fraction of that there would be an outrage but uh, yeah, alas, uh, former president and hopefully remains former president. And that would be, uh, and my money in politics. There's an article in the Times uh, yesterday about uh, $1.6 billion going for a shadowy Republican organization. I mean, that's a huge amount of money. You talk about dark money. I mean, Democrats uh, do it to an extent, but nothing like this. But, <clears throat> dark money. This is more like a black hole of uh, political uh, black hole of politics that would swallow American democracy. I mean, you can't have 1.6 billion dollars floating around. And uh, how is this a democracy? Your vote's the same as mine, but you have 1.6 billion, and I got nine dollars, or maybe eight dollars and ninety-five cents. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah, no, it's definitely an interesting time that we find ourselves in because it appears and, you know, I'm not saying that, like you said, both parties don't do these things to some extent, but when it came to the former president and lying, the it was completely off the scale. Like I'd never seen anything like that before in my entire life. Yeah, nobody has. Yeah, I've never. Seen. And then, you know, you're talking about dark money in politics and the the level of investment in one particular party versus the other. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a huge asymmetry there as well, uh, based off of the evidence. And none of this points in a good direction, in my opinion, just given the previous trend with the president and leaning towards authoritarian authoritarianism and yeah. like anti-democratic uh, values. Exactly. So yeah, can't agree more. Yeah, no, definitely not good. All right. Uh, well, at the end of your book, uh, so enough about politics. At the end of your book, you kind of wrap everything up and you provide a list of you provide a list of wonderful resources. So books, essentially, that you recommend. And I I'm just really curious to know why you felt compelled to include that section. Well, I, 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 a lot of the a number of the pieces in the book are columns that I wrote for abcnews.com. I, I, I chose some of the, uh, the, strong, the more re relevant, uh, still relevant columns, as well as a whole bunch of new stuff. And um, uh, some of these columns dealt with other books, not, not necessarily math books, books by um, uh, Stephen Gould and uh, Wolfram and, uh, and you know, uh, nudge and very various topics whose connection to, to math proper is kind of tenuous, but nevertheless, in this vaguely the same conceptual ballpark. And since I, I wrote reviews of them, uh, I decided to include the reviews of, of some of them at the end of the book. Because I'm, yeah, I'm consistent with my idea that math is a much broader, encompasses a much broader cognitive approach than uh, mm -hmm. just uh, computation or even just proving results about some minor mathematical object. Well, I certainly couldn't agree more. And I know that when I was going through the list, I was like, yeah, I definitely have to add a number of these to my rating list because some of them I've read already, but uh, there's a number there that I'd never heard of before. And I definitely should get to them at some point. I know that you have on that list, Roger Penrose's yeah. Road to Reality. 
I tried to read that when I was younger yeah, 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 and yeah. I just, I just couldn't, that thing is a, a dense tome and I, I find, I mean, maybe I can get through it now, but. Yeah, and, uh, most of the others aren't uh, as heavy as that, but uh, yeah, if you need a doorstop, that's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wonderful. So I'm curious, John, um, so you've, you've written this wonderful book, Who's Counting? And if you could, if you just had a couple of sentence, sentences, what would, uh, what would you say to individuals if they asked you, like, why should I read this? Why should I take time out of my day to read this book, Who's Counting? How will it help them to make their lives better? How will it help them, help them to, we're talking about mathematical thinking, so think better, to think, uh, to think more critically. Or... Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I describe it this way. It's part of the same idea that uh, mathematical literacy is a driver of bad policy, public policy, as well as personal decisions. And uh, this broad kind of claim is instantiated in the book by lots of examples, the stories from politics, from uh, stories about puzzles, stories about popular culture. Uh, stories about COVID. And um, so uh, the broad principle is the same as that of enumeracy, but the instances, the examples are, are either older from older columns of mine, but still very relevant. It's amazing how things haven't changed. And the new ones are, of course, very topical because they're, uh, they're new. And there are particular examples. I mean, it's one thing to kind of make this big proclamation. Another thing to say, here, look at this, look at scaling, look at false positives, look at uh, uh, a bullshit asymmetry principle, look at the conjunction fallacy. And these are examples that come up. So um, anybody can make profound sounding pronouncements, but you, uh, you should show people the meat. Where is it? Where are these examples? And what I try to do in, in Who's Counting, I mean, the subtitle is United Numbers and Narratives, is provide examples. Lots I know. Yeah, in, in story form, which is, which is, again, I commented earlier, I think is wonderful and uh, makes it definitely more of an enjoyable read than, let's say, reading a textbook or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, fantastic. I love it. I couldn't agree more with it. Where can people find the book? Where can people connect with you online? Let's say, you know, do you have any social media? Do you have a website? Sure. Uh, the book will be out next month and you can get it at the local bookstore. Assuming there are, are there aren't that many anymore, but of course you can get it from Amazon. You can pre-order it, even though it's not available. And there is a promotional uh, uh, promotion I'm uh, going to present them. Um, if you buy the book, you can uh, get a no expenses paid trip to anywhere you want. <laughs> Sorry, no expenses paid. Um, uh, actually, I wrote that once on my web page and somebody got irate because he misread no expenses. It's all expenses. Anyway, um, uh, yes, I do. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is John Allen Falls. I have. Um, I have a web page, and that, um, uh, I guess, because of authorial vanity, uh, is uh, johnallenpaulos.com. <laughs> so, for my web page and my Twitter feed, uh, uh, the web page li lists all my books, lists, uh, has links to many of my column columns or articles in the Times and various other uh, uh, periodicals that I've written for them. And Twitter, is, uh, like most uh, people on Twitter, I comment on everyday occurrences. Sometimes I comment on mathematical issues. Sometimes I just tell silly dad jokes. But uh, <laughs> That's too funny. All right, real quick, just for clarity. So this promotion that you're running, do you have to buy the book from a specific spot? Like no, a no. specific website? Or is it anywhere that you go and buy it, the shipping, shipping is going to be free? Uh, no, no, no. It's just no. It's, it's just uh, one of the silly dad jokes I just mentioned. That it, it's it's a non-offer. You get you can oh. go anywhere you want. That's just paid. Of course, you can go anywhere you want. You okay. Don't need to buy the book. Okay. 
<laughs> All right, so that just went straight over my head. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I, I should not do that since it's. Uh, no, that's fine. You're fine. Yeah. That's that's too funny. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right, wonderful. Well, anyway, I just want to thank you again so much for taking time out of your day to uh, to join me and to talk about this wonderful upcoming book. I again thoroughly enjoyed it. I love the stories. And for all of all of you, uh, those of you who are watching or listening, thank you so much for stopping by. And uh, always love hearing from you. So reach out with any sort of feedback. Go ahead, hit that like button. Please share it, and stay tuned for more great content coming your way. Take care. Okay.